In a much awaited development, the International Court of Justice delivered its ruling on South Africa's case against Israel. Now, the case was on violations of the Genocide Convention. While the court stopped short of calling for a ceasefire, which was South Africa's demand, it did make some vital interventions. Among other measures, it asked Israel to take all steps to prevent acts within the scope of the Genocide Convention, also asked Israel to report back in a month. The court also cited the brutal and insensitive statements by Israeli officials, including its president and defense minister. We go to Abdul to get a sense of the ruling and what lies ahead. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. A very momentous verdict and one which busts a lot of Israel's claims about what has been happening over the past three, three and a half months. So maybe for the benefit of our viewers, could you maybe take us through what are the key points in this ruling by the International Court of Justice? Well, Prashant, the International Court of Justice uh, in its interim verdict on Friday in the case against Israel committing genocide against Palestinians in Gaza brought by South Africa, uh, basically rules that it has a jurisdiction to basically uh, talk about, uh, to basically give a verdict on the, on the issue, which basically resolves the technical aspect of the case, which was earlier uh, made out by certain section of countries and the people that ICJ does not have, whether ICJ has a jurisdiction over uh, this particular allegation, the case or not. So that basically settled, that is settled now. Uh, second, it issues six uh, set of uh, instructions to Israel, which are related to primarily, of course, uh, provide greater humanitarian assistance to the people in Gaza. Uh, it means what Israel has been doing uh, so far in, in terms of preventing the, the inflow of uh, humanitarian aid in, in, inside the territory is basically not uh, anymore not acceptable. That is one, of course, one set of instructions. The second set of instructions are basic, uh, uh, are, is basically related to uh, how Israel has to take action to prevent any uh, attempt, uh, uh, you know, any act which basically can fall inside in the category of genocide. Uh, uh, could, uh, categorically, categorically asks the asks Israel to basically take action against all those people, including the high state officials, including uh, 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 the defense minister, and so on and so forth. Though it does not name uh, the minister explicitly, but of course it talks about all those people who have been inciting uh, genocidal acts against Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, there, sh there must be some action taken by uh, uh, the uh, uh, taken by Israelis. That is another. The third, of course, it also talks about uh, um, asks Israel to keep a record of all those uh, violations of genocide uh, convention and is uh, uh, the the laws against genocide uh, in its uh, uh, whatever in during its war inside gaza and presents uh, present a report uh, to the court uh, within a month about the compliance of uh, uh, on all those instructions which is uh, which icj has issued um, of course uh, the court stops short of kind of asking Israel to stop the war or asking Israel to kind of uh, uh, to cease fire inside Gaza. But uh, nevertheless, the verdict basically uh, kind of clearly uh, uh, paves the way for a, a final verdict, which of course uh, may take some time to come uh, uh, and uh, basically held Israel accountable uh, for its acts inside uh, uh, against Palestinians inside Gaza. Right, Abdul, in this context, now what lies ahead? What is the procedure that, you know, uh, pro what are the procedural aspects ahead? And, you know, what does this mean for the war? Well, Prashant, since the ICJ has ruled that it has a jurisdiction over the, over the case and, uh, and therefore, there will be proper... Uh, uh, hearing from la, uh, from now onwards till the final verdict is given. This this may take years to come. Uh, as far as uh, the, uh, the 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 fate of the interim verdict is concerned, of course, it is very difficult to say at this moment, given the record which Israel has and given the record which most of the other 
countries which have powerful countries backing them or they themselves have, are powerful uh, it is not uh, very optimistic uh, the hope uh, optimistic the situation is not very optimistic the only thing is uh, uh, if you see there have there had been verdict in the past against a particular state including israel when it come uh, uh, but in most of those cases the countries concerned have not uh, uh, have chosen to not uh, implement the verdict and since uh, they have been powerful countries uh, there is no uh, uh, even serious attempt made to in, uh, enforce those verdicts and israel has already said uh, that no matter what whatever is the verdict they are not going to stop their war inside uh, Ga inside gaza and uh, in fact uh, after the verdict came israel basically has completely rejected uh, even the interim uh, verdict uh, one thing uh, more which needs to uh, be taken into consideration when we talk about icj's uh, uh, verdict uh, uh, about the fate of the icj verdict uh, it it totally depends on how the close Uh, us uh, close is uh, countries uh, sorry the countries which are close to israel react to it uh, in fact uh, if the if you see the reaction made by the united states uh, which in fact is continues to uh, peddle the position which is took at the time when the uh, the case was filed against uh, israel by south africa that it is completely um, uh, baseless case and uh, has no merit and so on and so forth same thing uh, was similar things were repeated uh, uh, by the us uh, 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 on the day of the verdict uh, which basically makes us uh, uh, kind of uh, makes us skeptical about the future of the uh, the entire uh, of this verdict uh, so therefore uh, though the final verdict may take years to come even the interim verdict may not be implemented by israelis uh, given their uh, position so far and finally abdul if you could take us through what have been the kind of responses from around the globe both from countries as well as progressive sections progressive leaders what have been the kind of responses that you've seen well prashant most of the progressive sections across the world have welcomed uh, the icj's interim ruling uh, and hoped that israel will implement all the instructions given by the court uh including which is not given by the court of course including uh, immediate cease fire uh, uh some of the progress sections of course have have expressed reservations or you can say have expressed disappointment that the international court of justice has not asked for immediate cease fire because uh, if there is no cease fire the number of palestinians which are killed every day will keep on continuing there are already 26000 plus palestinians who have been killed in the israeli war and if there is no cease fire and by that and uh, since the 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 period between the interim judgment and the final judgment may be huge uh, it means that more and more palestinians will be killed in the future and if, and therefore there is a need for immediate cease fire so that part of course has been uh, uh, disappointing for most of the progressive sections um, as far as the third world countries and the global south overall is concerned of course they have well, most of them have welcomed the verdict and uh, asked israel to implement the verdict and in fact uh, again uh, kind of impose some uh, kind of implement some kind of cease fire there is no uh, a uh, need to continue the war uh, there has been no need for this war and this war should end as soon as, as soon as possible most of the countries have said south africa has expressed happiness of course that their uh, stand has been validated uh, and all those countries who had questioned south africa's motives are basically now should basically know that what south africa has done had had a mer had merit uh since uh, since the court has said that they have jurisdiction to rule over it um uh, as far as the west is concerned of course there are uh, different kinds of reactions coming uh, european union has welcomed the verdict and asked 
asked Israel to implement it. Um, uh, but some of the constituents of the European Union have not uh, expressed similar uh, opinions. Uh, in fact, they continue to back the Israeli uh, argument. Uh, and it seems that they are in no uh, they are in no hurry to ask Israel to kind of implement some kind of ceasefire. The, the stand of the United States in particular is remains the same as it was when the case was filed uh, by South Africa that this case is baseless and therefore uh, uh, it basically uh, has uh, has also in a way uh, kind of has not expressed any uh, had expressed reservation about the verdict uh, which came out of uh, ICJ on Friday. So US uh, and some of the Western countries continue to support the Israeli uh, 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 war and continue to basically uh, defy all the uh, all the claims of Israeli you know, Israel committing genocide inside occupied Palestinian territories, including uh, in Gaza. But uh, rest of the world and most of the progressive sections have hope that Israel will implement uh, the verdict and also uh, um, uh, kind of uh, impose some kind of ceasefire as early as possible. Thanks so much for talking to us, Abdul. The 154th session of the World Health Organization's Executive Board began on January 22nd and concludes on January 27th. This is a significant meeting as the World Health Assembly is set to be held in May and key issues that will come up then are being discussed now. Among them are the pandemic treaty, which we have talked about often on this show, the discussions around the various violations and the attacks on health workers in Palestine also took place. To understand more about this, we go to Anna. Anna, thank you for joining us. So, uh, the executive board meeting ahead of a very vital WHA in May. So, could you maybe take us through what were the agenda items on the EB's uh, for the for the EB this time? What were the key topics that were being discussed? Interestingly, one of the agenda points that sparked most interest uh, during the beginning of the executive board was uh, was a point that was actually not on the agenda. So that was the pandemic treaty. And of course, we know that uh, WHO members uh, are now closing towards the, uh, the deadline that they set to themselves uh, for uh, finalizing the draft of a pandemic treaty by May this year, when the World Health Assembly will meet uh, in Geneva. So uh, we also know that the work on the treaty began uh, when the world was going through the through the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then uh, there were some WHO members who were really eager to translate what they were seeing uh, on the field during the pandemic uh, into a new formal WHO mechanism. So uh, we know that, you know, two years since then, or so, uh, this turned out to be a very different thing uh, for different members. Uh, we do know, as we spoke here before, that the Global South members were quite eager uh, to develop a mechanism that essentially uh, provides more basis for work done on the, on the basis of solidarity of international cooperation. On the other hand, we do know that the Global North countries uh, still seem to put uh, on protecting uh, the interests of themselves and of uh, the big pharma companies that they are hosting. So all of this has kind of contributed to a stall or difficulties in the conversation uh, around uh, the pandemic treaty. And now that May is getting closer, uh, people inside the WHO are getting a bit nervous about whether the deadline in May uh, uh, will be met. So this is something that uh, that has been voiced during the first day of the exec executive board already. Um, of course, you know, in, even if the pandemic treaty does not happen, we do know that what um, what probably will lead to a conclusion are the negotiations around the international health regulations, uh, which are uh, an existing mechanisms uh, mechanism that are uh, that is very important for for the navigation of WHO and in me member states in um, in in cases of uh, of extraordinary uh, health uh, health events, if we want to call them that. So uh, the pandemic treaty, as such, was not on the agenda. Uh, what is on the agenda? Uh, is of course universal health coverage a concept that also we have spoken here on a couple of, uh, on a couple of occasions, 
uh, and that seems to uh, to continue. Although the WHO Secretariat now uh, has compiled the report, which essentially shows that you know the concept is failing. It's not. It's not doing what's it, what it's supposed to do, and that is increase access to healthcare and, of course, offer offer uh, protection, financial protection to uh, to people. Universal health coverage is going to be a big um, a big topic, but so is climate change. So climate change is something that's uh, now being introduced into several WHO documents in different ways. Uh, and while this is very a very important breakthrough, uh, what we are also seeing is that. Uh, the introduction of climate change does not always correspond to having uh, practical aims or uh, even practical ideas of how the existing budget and resources of the WHO and its members will support uh, the work that needs to be done on climate change and health. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have something that's uh, that's been very important uh, for the last uh, for the past years not only because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also because of the growing number of wars and armed conflicts that um, that uh, that are happening. And that's WHO's work in health emergencies. So uh, all of these things uh, are also going to be discussed in, in the light, of course, of the finances, of the resources made available for, uh, to WHO for its work. Uh, we did speak on uh, on previous occasions about the reforms or the changes. Maybe it's better to call them changes that uh, member states and the WHO are trying to find in order to make the WHO more flexible in its work, uh, in order to make sure that the core programs are financed well uh, and that uh, the fun funding that's available uh, can be used in different ways that the WHO secretariat uh, feels is necessary to do. So we do know that, you know, in 2023, uh, we had some talk about changes which went uh, into the increase of flexible funding through DSS contributions, uh, which are contributions that member states have to pay to, that, to the WHO. Uh, but in addition to that, we are also seeing ad uh, another round of uh, additional financing uh, mechanisms that still rely uh, on what the problems were in the first place, and that's uh, drawing in more support from philanthropic capitalists, from public, uh, from private public alliances such as Gavi, uh, which essentially try and shape WHO's priority and drive its work uh, in one way or another, uh, independently of what the proper members, so the countries of the world, uh, try to uh, try to see the WHO doing and want. Uh, to see the WHO doing. Right, of course also Palestine on the minds of everybody. So were there discussions also on the attack on health workers uh, and health facilities and the health infrastructure of the people of Gaza? Um, when it comes to the health situation in Palestine and particularly Gaza, uh, the executive board will follow up upon the special session that it held uh, in late 2023. And so at the end of that special session, the board members uh, requested the Director General of the WHO uh, to compile a report uh, on what is happening in Gaza. Uh, so that's one of the documents that the representatives will have in front of their, uh, themselves uh, during this session of, uh, of the Executive Board. And of course, uh, you know, this document documents uh, or talks about the things that the WHO has been warning all over, uh, all, all the time since the, the latest attacks on Gaza uh, started to, started to, uh, started. So um, they report on uh, the immense damage that was caused in those attacks to Palestinian health infrastructure. Uh, they also talk about the ways that the Israeli occupying forces target and kill health workers. So uh, the the WHO continues to be present in Gaza. Uh, the teams do try and get in and go on humanitarian and health missions in order to deliver food, in order in order to deliver fuel uh, to hospitals which need them for the generators, in order to deliver medical medical materials and so on. But of course, you know uh, the reports from those teams have been published on WHO's uh, communication channels all the time, and we are hearing repeatedly that uh, even the teams 
like them, so UN teams uh, are of course experiencing problems because they are not get getting the security assurances by the Israeli to get in. They're not allowed to go in certain parts of Gaza uh, and uh, the, the delivery of fuel in particular uh, is often delayed um, because of that. So just recently a WHO mission um, finished its, uh, its another visit to, uh, to Al Shifa Hospital. Uh, it took them 10 days uh, or more to get to Shifa twice. So, um, and of course, you know, that, that has severe implications on how the hospital is supposed to work uh, and how it's supposed to get operations back going after, after it was forced to essentially shut down at one point. And so uh, in this regard, the WHO Secretariat, of course, has been very vocal about the ceasefire for a very long time. Um, we've heard the calls coming from the teams who are there in the occupied Palestinian territories who have, uh, who have the, essentially the experience from the ground. But of course, we have also heard those calls by, by the director general Tedros himself. So, uh, it's not surprising to see all of these things reflected in the report, uh, which is in front of the executive board. Now, what will be interesting to see, uh, is how the bo uh, board members will react because we know that uh, among those serving on the executive board of the WHO right now are also representatives from countries uh, that have expressed support towards Israel, uh, even as Israel has engaged in very clear genocidal acts and attacks against healthcare in Gaza. Thank you so much, Anna. That's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode on Monday. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Thank you.